Жемчужины Китая. Популярные темы. Ici Radio Mondial Adventist, la voix de l'espérance. Here is Adventist World Radio, the Stone of the Hopeless. La Vieja de la Esperanza This is Adventist World Radio, the voice of hope. For more information, visit us on the web at awr.org. The following program is in... program from Adventist World Radio. Researched and written in Indianapolis by Dr. Adrian Peterson and produced in the studios of WRMI Shortwave in Okeechobee, Florida. I'm Jeff White. This is edition NWS 612 for release on Sunday, November 15th, 2020. And the program today, Radio Nepal on Shortwave. Uh, the Bangladesh DX Report and the World DX News. During the past almost three quarters of the century, Nepal has been noted on the shortwave at a total of five different transmitter locations. We begin our story today at their earliest location, which, as Ray Robinson tells us, was not at the capital city of Kathmandu, but rather in the country town and 250 road miles distant. Thanks, Jeff. This first location was at Biratnagar, the congested regional city of Biratnagar in eastern Nepal, with its quarter million population, lies just three miles from the border with India. The metropolitan location named Biratnaga, which in translation means the huge fully. And the name honors an ancient local leader, King Virat. Biratnaga is listed as the industrial capital of the nation of Nepal. On December 13, 1950, at 8.30pm, a new shortwave voice was heard in Nepal, and it identified on air in the Nepali language as Nepal Prajatantra Radio meaning Radio Democracy in the fall. This temporary clandestine... 
5100 kilohertz in the 41 meter shortwave band that was in use for both amateur communication and program broadcasting. This new low power shortwave radio station was filed with a good signal in nearby areas of Nepal and India. For example at Kathmandu, Darjeeling and Calcutta. It's probable that the technical equipment for radio democracy was already in use as a communication station to contact with a similar station in Kathmandu. The Kathmandu communication station was installed at a suburban location identified as Akashbani, meaning a voice from the sky, the name borrowed from India. The second shortwave location in Nepal was at Singer Durbar. Three months after Radio Democracy was launched in Birat Nagar, the technical equipment was removed and installed in Singer Durbar in Kathmandu, together with additional electronic items from the Akashbani station. The actual site at Singer Durbar, which means Lion Palace by the way, in the Royal Administrative area of Kathmandu, was inside a two-story building previously in use as a school for the children of the royal family. The new radio broadcasting station, known initially as Nepal Radio, was inaugurated on April 1st, 1950, with the same 150 watts on the same shortwave channel, 7100 kilohertz. When the daily routine settled down, the station was on the air in three daily transmission periods, totaling three and a quarter hours. The third location was at Jualakel. A decade later, a transmitter station was constructed at Jualakel, three miles southeast from Kathmandu. A single five kilowatt shortwave transmitter, assembled by AWA in Australia with Philips and AWA components, and made available by Australian Aid, was installed and taken into service in 1956. Monitoring reports suggest that this transmitter was in use mainly on 7105 kilohertz. So earlier short-term usage was noted on 7100 and 6004 kilohertz. A second 5 kilowatt shortwave transmitter, similar to the first, and again made available by Australian Aid, was installed at Kiwalako six years later in 1966. The monitoring reports indicate that it transmitted on at least seven different wave frequencies. After the inauguration of another short wave station or the proper station, the Jualakel station was reserved to standby status. So the two low power short wave transmitters were activated for a series of test aircraft once each year. Ultimately, Transmitter 1 was to be cannibalized for parts to enable Transmitter 2 to be activated. And soon after the turn of the century, this sort of double transmitter was removed from Duala Cell and the station itself was gone closed. Shortwave location number 4 was at Sindhu by Sapati, some 5 miles southeast from Kathmandu. Uh, in 1983, Japan constructed a new shortwave station. When Duralico was closed, the hybrid 5 kilowatt shortwave transmitter was removed and the installed it in the Vice Party for use as an emergency standby unit on the same 5005 kilohertz channel. However, around the year 2013, this transmitter was finally also unusable and silenced forever. Location number 5 was Kumalta. During the year 1968, a 100 kilowatt Marconi shortwave transmitter from England, model CD-1003, was installed in a new transmission facility located at Kumalta, also some five miles southeast from Kathmandu. Test broadcasts from this unit began on 9590 kHz in late summer, though an additional channel, 7165 kHz, was added in the next year, 1969. Ten years later, in 1978, an American 100 kilowatt shortwave transmitter, model SW100, was added, and both units were then active with parallel programming. For more years, 1982, and a third shortwave transmitter was installed at Kumal R, an updated Harris model SW100O. His Majesty the King officially inaugurated this third unit as well as a suite of new studios on May the 9th, 1983. At times there were then three 100 kilowatt transmitters on the air, 
Though there were many occasions when the low-powered 5 kilowatt transmitters at Jawalakel took over some of the main transmissions from Kemal Khan. At this stage, Radio Nepal introduced three channels of programming. Channel 1 was the national program on medium wave and 5005 kilohertz shortwave. Channel 2 was a commercial service on 7165 kilohertz shortwave only. And then the external service, which at different times was carried on all operational transmitters. During the year 2006, repair work was performed on the 5005 kilohertz transmitter and this produced a clear signal for a while, but then the old core modulation returned. In addition, there were times when the station was off air during power cuts in the area. And then in 2012, the shortwave service was closed. However, six years later again, whatever transmitter equipment was still serviceable was assembled into a low-power hybrid transmitter that was operational at between 10 and 20 kilowatts on the usual 5005 kilohertz channel. In September 2018, test broadcasts were noted from this unit. Now back last month here in Wavescan, we referred to that this news in the American NASWA journal, which stated that the low-powered shortwave transmitter on 5005 kilohertz in Nepal was closed. So we posed the question, which shortwave transmitter at what location was closed in June 2020? Now, we've presented here in Wavescan over the past month or two our research into the history of each of the five shortwave locations in Nepal at Spirit Nagar, Singha Durbar, Jawalakel, Sindhu Baisapati, and Kumalkar, each of which, incidentally, can be seen on Google Earth. And thus it becomes very clear that the last analogue shortwave transmitter in Nepal was a somewhat hybrid unit assembled from whatever was needed from the three 100 kilowatt units, one Martini and two Harris, so it was operating at around just 10 kilowatts. This transmitter was located at Kumalkar on the familiar 5005 kilohertz, and it was last mounted on air back on September the 18th, 2018, though some transmitter tests were conducted during the following year, 2019. The 10 kilowatt shortwave transmitter of the Kumalkar shortwave station was officially closed on June 18th, earlier this year, 2020. And Nepal is now silent on shortwave. Back to you, Jeff. Thank you, Ray Robinson at KVOH in Los Angeles. Yeah, I hope you don't mind me putting in this small plug for Voice of Hope Africa, but we do have some interesting news, because effective this week, actually, we've been able to increase our broadcasting hours from Zambia. The local electricity supply in Zambia has been much more stable in recent weeks, which has enabled this expansion. So basically, we're resuming our morning broadcasts in English from 0400 to 0800 UTC daily, 9680 and 11680 kilohertz and we're launching a new two-hour Swahili language service in the afternoon to East Africa from 1200 to 1400 UTC daily on 9680 kilohertz only. The timing and frequencies of the late afternoon and evening daily broadcast in English remain the same except that we'll be closing a half hour earlier at 2100 UTC instead of 2140. So that's 1400 to 1600 UTC daily on 9680 and 6065 kilohertz, and then 1600 to 2100 UTC daily on 4965 and 6065 kilohertz. On Sundays, there will now be a second airing of wave scan. The first will be at 0600 UTC on 9680 and 11680 kilohertz, and the second, which may be audible in Europe and elsewhere, will continue to be heard at 1800 UTC on 4965 and 6065 kilohertz. On our website, www.voiceofhope.com, there is a full program schedule and of course a high quality web stream that parallels the shortwave broadcast, but in stereo. With love from Zambia, this is the Voice of Hope Africa, broadcasting on 4965 and 6065 kilohertz and streaming worldwide at voiceofhope.com. We're testing the gospel of Jesus. This is the Voice of Hope. And now from Nepal, we go to nearby India. 
And we have an email from Sandipan Basu Malik who uh, writes on behalf of the Indian BX Club International in Kolkata, West Bengal. And he says that the Asian BX Review monthly newsletter from the Indian BX Club International is back again. After a long gap, we are pleased to release the digital edition of the popular newsletter, he says. And he attaches a copy of the latest edition. Uh, there's a very interesting uh, article um, on the front page, in fact, of the uh, latest uh, Asian um, DX review. Actually, this is the October uh, edition. edition. And uh, it's by Dr. Kupatik Banatani. And I want to read uh, most of the article to you today here on Wayscan because it's uh, very interesting. Um, uh, look at the uh, sort of the recent history of DXing. He says, when the Asian DX review last rolled out of the press in 1990, DXing was different. There was no internet. We had to eagerly wait for the DX program like DX Jukebox, later renamed Media Network, and other DX programs to copy down the tips for DX hunting. Once in a week, we would get the Sunspot number. DX magazines, like our Asian DX review, reached people by post. Digital frequency readout receivers were already there, but they were beyond the reach of the average listener. One couldn't buy radio receivers from the Internet, and imports were prohibitively priced. We would ogle at the reviews of the Yesu FRG7. The bands were very much full of broadcast signals, and International shortwave broadcasters like the BBC, Voice of America, Radio Moscow, and Deutsche Welle were the powerhouses, besides other national and missionary broadcasts. There were a few clandestine stations, too, like Mujahideen Ekak, or stations from South Sudan. Man-made radio noise was much less because incandescent lamps were the mainstay, and CFL had not yet arrived. There were no mobile phones. No mobile phone towers. During sunspot lows, the medium waves were full of Japanese regionals on lucky days. The tropical bands were all full of Indonesians in the evening. Africans appeared late evening and night, and then the Latins in the early Indian morning. The discerning DXer then logged exotic stations like Cook Island, which Kandu did, and the antenna was a piece of copper wire. Reception reports were still sent by mail and often with IRCs, international reply coupons, to facilitate a QSL card. QSL cards arrived by post, often with a pennant and other goodies like exciting stamps. The extras met in person over small group gatherings through the landline and through bulletin. Then there was a hiatus of 30 years during which period the extras did go on listing QSL face-to-face -face meetings, the expeditions, and communicating through land phones. A couple of exciting the expeditions along the Bay of Bengal did keep us enthused about the action. Then came the Internet. It developed slowly but steadily and changed the very face of the exit. The exit was gently turned upside down. Where are we today? As the Internet grew, it took a toll on radio broadcasting, especially on shortwave. As you could get instant news online and listen to a distant station through live streaming, shortwave stations began to close down. Deutsche Welle is an example. It ran its Trinkamali relay station to the thick of the Tamil Elam movement and beamed in excellent signals to Africa, the Far East, South Asia, but closed down its own services in 2015 and handed it back to the Sri Lanka Broadcasting Corporation who now rent out airtime from there. The power-guzzling shortwave transmitters were a four-second to FM and Internet and began to close down. Today, the national broadcasters have shortwave broadcasting mainly focused to the African continent. Boys were taken up somewhat by the missionaries, and it isn't uncommon to find Transworld Radio and Adventist World Radio broadcasting from relay stations of national broadcasters around the world. Medium wave, however, still remains relevant to cover thinly spread communities over great distances. And long wave in Algeria, Mongolia, and Romania survives for the same reason. As there was an explosion of household electronic devices, 
the menace of man-made radio frequency interference took on an ugly proportion. To receive the simple BBC blaring to India from relay stations in Singapore and Thailand, one would need a good receiver and an antenna, and the shortwave signal would have to rise above the radio frequency interference. With the rise of internet and global trade, the extras in India, just like the rest of the world, could get the state-of-the-art radio receivers sometimes delivered right to their doorstep. As the number of DXers dwindled, the manufacturers like ICOM and Alinko stopped making lower-end receivers like the R75 and the DXRHT. In the meantime, the entry of software-defined radios, SDRs, was a revolution. From the lower-priced RTL Donga to the Perseus, Suddenly, PC or laptop matched the performance of the best communication receiver. You did not need to stay up late to scan the band for that Vietnamese regional because your SDR would switch on, scan the entire band, ready for you to listen at your pleasure. QSL took a different dimension altogether with EQSLs, now the rule. Babu Gupta's EQSL of LRA-36 in Antarctica, a big sensation in the Indian media, and it brought in a good number of new hobbyists. The Sunspot played a spoiler, too. The prolonged Sunspot low of Solar Cycle 24 pushed the shortwave bands out of function for some time, but medium-wave DXers could relish distant catches. The shortwave broadcasts in the tropical bands were almost gone. Bulletins of the past were replaced by Facebook, that group, which could communicate instantly. And there are personal and group blogs, the flagship DX Club kept up their presence online, like the Australian Radio DX Club. Glenn Hauser, with regular monitoring posts and the standing tall World Radio TV handbook, have also kept DXing alive. S. Alki's exhaustive frequency list to give you the latest radio frequency reference you wanted, just as a medium wave list would. On the broadcasting side, DRM is the new kid on the block, and many broadcasters now have DRM simulcast. The standalone DRM receivers have had their own hardware issues, but the SDR fills the gap. However, this mode is yet to catch up. So where does the Asian DX Review Digital Edition fit in? It now comes with our own flavor of DX reporting. We are here to give a life to those frequency lists and schedules and encourage others to speak. Our aim is to keep DX alive and speaking. That article by Dr. Supratik Sanatani in the latest edition of the Asian DX Review, the October edition, actually. Uh, uh, Indian DX Club International, which publishes it, is an informal association of DXers, mainly from India, headquartered in Kolkata. The club brings out the Asian DX Review DX Bulletin, which is presently an online publication and is distributed free. It's also been active in organizing DX editions and promoting the hobby of radio DXing in general. And if you have feedback, loggings, etc., for publishing an Asian DX Review, you can contact the Indian DX Club International by email. Here's the address idxc.international at gmail.com. Again, that's idxc.international at gmail.com. So thanks a lot to uh, Sandipan Basu Malik and everyone there at the Asian DX Review, and congratulations to them for uh, resuming the publication of their excellent DX bulletin. Now we're going very close to there again, Bangladesh. Here's Salahuddin Dalai with his Bangladesh DX report for this month. Dear listeners and radio hobbies, welcome you in another edition of Bangladesh DX report in Uyghurstan. This is Salahuddin Dalai from Rakshahi, Bangladesh. Glad to be back and thanks for listening. The receiving log of different radio stations. November 1st. In East to World Radio, Bengali Service. Listeners mail the program. Uh, uh, 1315 UTC on 11685 kHz. The ISO code was 444. BBC Bengali Service. News and current affairs. Program was heard at 1340 UTC on 11710 kHz. The ISO code was 
3333. November 2nd, Radio Farda, Part 2 and Part 3. Musical program was heard at 1705 UTC on 5860 kHz. Drive-by code was 333. BBC, Bhaya Korean program was heard at 1710 UTC on 5895 kHz. Drive-by code was 3. Voice of Sarki, Azeri Sarki, musical program was heard at 1718 UTC on 5965 kHz. The ISI code was 333. BBC, Bhaya Al Sila, Dari language program was heard at 1730 UTC on 690 kHz. The ISI code was 433. November 3rd. All India Radio, Dari Sarji, Indian Music was heard at 1435 UTC on 11560 kHz, the code was 333. ATBC Radio, Gospel Song was heard at 1341 UTC on 11600 kHz, the code was 444. Radio Romania International, Chinese Service, closing announcement with interval signal was heard at 1400 high 7 UTC on 11825 kHz, the code was 333. November 4th, High of Turkey, playing Turkish music was heard at 1330 UTC on 15390 kHz, the code was 333. Radio Saudi Arabia, Arabic talk was heard at 1348 UTC on 17615 kHz. Adventist World Radio, Bhaya Talata Valandari, Vietnamese program was heard at 1345 UTC on 17770 kHz. The code was 343. Bhaya Ishudu Hausa program was heard at 1338 UTC on 17800 kHz. The ISI code was 232. China Radio International Bhaya Bamaka Mali French language program was heard at 1340 UTC on 1780. 80 kHz, the ISI code was 242. KMLS, Russian program was heard at 1827 UTC on 9880 kHz, the ISI code was 343. Many, many thanks to Mr. Sodish Chandra Kundu from Agurtala Tripura, India for sharing his log with us. If you have any comments and suggestions and send your reception report to bxbangla at the rate gmail.com. The address again bxbangla -E bxbangla at the rate gmail.com. Okay, I will come with more DX news in the next edition. Till then, take care. Salaudin Dollar, Rastani Bangla. Thank you very much, Salaudin. Music from Asna Alapita in India ends this edition of WaveScan, the international DX program from Adventist World Radio. Researched and written in Indianapolis by Adrian Peterson. Next week, the radio story on four Greek islands. We'll have the story of an important Indian medium wave station. In fact, we have an item from uh, Joseph Jacob telling us that after the decommissioning of five shortwave transmitters of 50 kilowatts by All India Radio last month, next is the turn of medium wave transmitters. The 200 kilowatt medium wave transmitter of AIR Alabuza in Kerala was closing down according to a press report of November 7th. But just Jacob tells us that the AIR Alabuza 576 kilohertz decommissioning has been put on hold. We'll have a station profile of this important meeting station on Wavescan next week. 
as well as our Australian DX report from Bob Padula. Several QSL cards are available for this program. Send your AWR and KSDA reception reports for WaveScan to the AWR address in Bangkok, Thailand, and also to the station your radio is tuned to, WRMI or WWCR or KVOH or Voice of Hope Africa, or to IRRS Italy or to the AWR relay stations that carry WaveScan. Remember, too, you can send a reception report to the DX reporters when their segment is on the air. Here in the program, they will also verify with their own colorful QSL card. Return postage and an address label are always appreciated. The email address for AWR QSL card is qsl at awr.org. The postal address for AWR QSL is Adventist World Radio, P.O. Box 234, 